you're not gonna be like two or three years old and be like, I killed the Black Dahlia. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please do subscribe. And if you're old here, hello again. My name's Kate Philpott. This is Sandy. Say hi. And today I'm gonna to be covering a pretty dark case. It is an unsolved murder from quite a while ago, from 1947. And it's probably one of the most famous unsolved murders there is. So this is the case of the Black Dahlia. So on the 15th of January, 1947, there were remains found of a 22 year old woman called Elizabeth Short, AKA the Black Dahlia. Her body was mutilated in a bizarre yet graphic way and that's pretty much why the case got so much attention. I'll go into the details of that in a little bit but for now I want to tell you a little bit about Elizabeth Short and what we know about her. So Elizabeth grew up in Medford, Massachusetts with her parents and four sisters so big enough family. <laughs> her father would build mini golf courses and pretty much was very wealthy until the 1929 stock market crash where he lost pretty much everything and the family became broke. And the following year then in 1930, the father's car was found on Charlestown Bridge and he was nowhere to be found. So it was assumed that he committed suicide by jumping into the Charles River. And while Elizabeth was growing up, she had a lot of respiratory issues and struggles. She actually had a lung surgery at age 15 and the doctors basically told her, you know what, it's probably best if you move to a warmer climate in the winter months. So. That's pretty much what she did. She would go down to Florida, spend time with family friends during winter, and then would go back up to Massachusetts in the warmer months. So fast forward to 1942, Elizabeth's mother receives a letter, a letter of apology from her husband. Yes, you heard that right. Her husband who she thought had committed suicide 12 years prior. And he just said, look, I'm sorry I left. I'm not dead. I just started a new life in California, which I guess like he has the right to do that, but like, whoa. <laughs> so the December that Elizabeth was 18, she actually relocated to California and moved in with her dad, who she hadn't seen since she was six years old. But unfortunately, she didn't last all that long there. She only lasted about a month before she had to move out because her and her father were bickering and just arguing a lot. In mid-1943 then, she actually moved to Santa Barbara. Soon after this, in September, she was actually arrested for underage drinking at a local bar. But because of this, the juvenile authorities were like, yeah, you gotta go back to Massachusetts. Um, so she was sent back, but she didn't actually spend much time there. She would actually base herself in Florida and then she would go up to Massachusetts every now and again. And then in the final six months of her life, she'd been living back in Los Angeles, working as a waitress. Okay, so the days leading up to her murder. As we know, her remains were found on the 15th of January, 1947, but she hadn't actually been seen alive since the 9th of January, six days prior. So she had just returned home from a brief trip to San Diego where she was spending time with this guy called Robert Manley. But this guy, he was a 25 year old salesman, so like that's normal enough, but he was married. But he says he dropped her off at the Biltmore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles and that she was gonna go meet her sister who had been visiting from Massachusetts. But shortly after she was dropped off at the Biltmore Hotel, she was actually seen in the Crown Grill cocktail lounge, which is pretty close to the Biltmore Hotel. And these seem to be the last known details of her whereabouts while she was alive. All right, <laughs> let's get into the... Uh, Juicy details. So Elizabeth Short was found murdered on a vacant lot by a woman called Betty Bersinger, who was, oh my God, just out walking her three-year-old daughter. Not ideal, <laughs> that poor child. And this poor woman, Betty Bersinger, she initially thought that Elizabeth Short was just a mannequin until she got a closer look and realized that this was a human body. And the reason it looked so much like a mannequin was because the body was so drained of blood that she was that pale. Her body was found on 3800 Norton Avenue and she was found naked and severed in two pieces. But the way her body was found and the way she was bisected, they said whoever did this must have had a great amount of knowledge about anatomy and the human body because there was no trauma to internal organs or bones. Her eyes were also open and her face had been cut 
from the corners of her mouth all the way to her ears, creating this chilling, permanent smile, otherwise known as the Glasgow smile, which, oh, so creepy. And they also found that this was done to her face while she was still alive. And the body had clearly been washed by the killer and there was no blood surrounding it. So they presumed that, you know, she was killed somewhere else and then discarded on this vacant lot. However, she was clearly posed. So she had her arms up above her head and her elbows bent at right angles and her legs were spread apart. So the medical examiners determined that she had been dead for at least 10 hours before her discovery, which would leave her being killed somewhere on the night of the 14th of January or the early morning hours of the 15th of January because Betty Bersinger found her at about 10 a.m. All right, let's get into the autopsy. So the day after she was discovered, Frederick Newbar, the LA County coroner, carried out her autopsy. There were lacerations on the surfaces of her arms and the lower left side of her chest. And in relation to the bisection, there was no bruising as a result of this. So that would suggest that it was carried out after she died. She did have bruising though on the front and side of her head, suggesting that she had sustained blows to the head. And from these blows, she had a concussion. There were also marks on her legs, wrist, neck, and her right thigh that would suggest that she had been bound and tortured. Her cause of death was hemorrhaging due to the lacerations and shock from the blows to the head. Okay, this next piece of information literally made me say, what the f Because it's just, the most disgusting thing ever. Once Elizabeth had been identified, a reporter from the LA Examiner reached out to Elizabeth's mother and told her that her daughter had won a beauty contest. So you might be going, huh? <laughs> it was only after prying as much personal information as she possibly could out of Elizabeth's mother that she told her, actually she didn't win a beauty contest, she was actually murdered. What? That is just so disgusting and sleazy. Like talk about adding insult to injury. And then um, the next part I was like, oh, okay, well at least I did that. So <laughs> the LA examiner offered to pay for her mother's flights and accommodation out to LA, but that just ended up being another sick ploy to get as much personal information out of her and to protect the inside scoop and keep her away from the police. Okay, a few days after she was discovered, things start getting really interesting. Six days after she was discovered, um, a phone call came through to the LA Examiner and this person claimed to be the killer and congratulated them on their coverage of the case. And this guy on the phone said he eventually planned on turning himself in, but he was gonna just let the police pursue him a little bit further. He then told them to expect some souvenirs from Beth Short in the mail. And he wasn't lying, because <laughs> three days after that, the LA Examiner received a letter. And this note said, the Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers, here is Dahlia's belongings, letter to follow. Also with this letter was Elizabeth Short's birth certificate. How the hell did they get that? <laughs> Her social security card, some photographs, some names written on a piece of paper, and an address book with the name Mark Hansen on the front. The package had clearly been cleaned with gasoline so there were no fingerprints, and whoever killed her did the same with her body, so you would think, okay, this probably is our guy. But um, they didn't do the best job because there was still a fingerprint on there, and they managed to lift this fingerprint, <laughs> but it was destroyed in transit <laughs> before it could be processed which is just, uh, I don't know if it was because of police incompetence or if it was just unlucky, but I just feel like, oh, that could be the one thing we needed. On the same day, uh, ooh. Oh, what are you doing? Oh. On the same day, a handbag and a black suede shoe were found in an alley and these were later determined to definitely be Elizabeth. Not sure if they ever tested those for evidence, but I'm guessing they did and nothing came from it. On the 26th of January then, so this is 11 days after the murder, the LA examiner received another letter and it said, here it is turning in on Wednesday, January 29th, 10 a.m. Had my fun with police, Black Dahlia Avenger. So the letter also gave a location. So the police were like, cool, let's go to this place at this time. And that is what they did. They showed up at 10 a.m. on the 29th of January. 
but the killer never showed. And then at 1 p.m. that day, they received communication again saying, have changed my mind, you would not give me a square deal. Dahlia killing was justified. And just on this justification part, I did see a report that a local stripper had spoken about Elizabeth Short and they were acquaintances. And she basically told police that Elizabeth liked to get guys worked up about her and then she'd leave them hanging dry. So I guess that is interesting. Like there was a lot about her potentially being like this temptress. And I also read somewhere that it was like a sex fiend slayer type murder or something. And I feel like, I mean, at what point can you discuss this without being really disrespectful? <laughs> but it definitely could allude to a potential motive for murder. So there was an absolute media frenzy on this case. The newspapers and everything were all over it. And my guess is that the killer was just sitting back watching this madness unfold and just thinking, <laughs> I did this, you know, just real smug. Like I'm sure whoever it was, was just loving it. But yeah, the police actually received 13 letters from the killer over the course of the investigation, none of which ended up leading to who he was because obviously it's still an unsolved murder, but it just makes me think that he was just teasing, just like, haha, I'm gonna make this even more dramatic. After this though, the LAPD interviewed 150 men who they thought were potential suspects and nothing really came of any of these interviews. However, it's clear that the police definitely thought it was a solvable case because the amount of manpower they had working on it. They had a total of 750 LAPD investigators, 400 sheriff's deputies, and 250 California State Patrol officers. Which, I mean, that's a lot. That's nearly 1,500 officers just working on this one case. Okay, so it gets to the point where they're like, look, we're not getting anywhere here. We need to start looking at this differently. So they look at how the body was bisected. And they're thinking, this is very surgical and precise. We need to look at who nearby has this level of medical knowledge. So they got a search warrant for the University of Southern California Medical School, which ironically was literally just up the road from where her body was found. But again, nothing came of this. <laughs> Oh my God. On the 14th of March, a suicide note was found like scrawled in pencil, tucked into a shoe in a pile of men's clothing by the waterfront. Here's what the note said. To whom it may concern, I have waited for police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but have not. I am too much of a coward to turn myself in. So this is the best way out for me. I couldn't help myself for that or this. Sorry, Mary. To be quite honest, I didn't see it referred to, but I, I really don't know who Mary is. Unless like, you know the way with old style names, like they randomly call someone by a totally different name. Like, like if your name is Tommy, you might be referred to as Richard or something. Like just random thing. So I'm, I'm like, is this, is he just referring to Elizabeth as Mary? Is that a normal thing? Cause that is kind of ringing bells in my head, but I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> if you um, understand who, who Mary is, uh, maybe let us know because I'm kind of confused. But yeah, so they looked into the clothes that were left there and they didn't give any clues about who this could have been from. So as you can probably see, over the years, so many leads came in, but not one of them actually led to anything. It pretty much went cold because eventually the leads just stopped coming. But I do just want to talk about the suspects we do have and also just a little word on confessions. Many people confess to murdering the Black Dahlia. In fact, police received 500 confessions to this murder. And just some of these people weren't even born when the Black Dahlia was murdered. <laughs> which, which they must have been so much younger because you're not gonna be like two or three years old and be like, I killed the Black Dahlia. <laughs> like, so they must have been in their late teens, early twenties, which I find incredibly bizarre. <laughs> and obviously because there were 500 confessions, there were a lot of suspects in this case, but I'm just gonna talk about the ones that are the most suspicious and I guess 
the most well known because I'm not gonna sit here and talk about 500 different people. <laughs> so suspect number one, Robert Manley. Obviously Robert Manley is the guy who had spent a bit of time with Elizabeth in San Diego. He's the one that dropped her off at the Biltmore Hotel. He was the one that was married and was seeing this girl and they'd supposedly been seeing each other for about a month before she died. And the thing about Robert Manley, he was actually very persistent with her because initially she rejected him, but eventually I guess she, she gave in to his advances and they started dating. But the thing about him was he returned to San Diego almost a week before her body was discovered. And he passed several polygraph tests. So not even just one, because I know polygraph, you know, it's not really the most accurate thing, but he passed several, but then there are a couple of things that are like, ooh, hmm. Number one, Robert Manley was admitted to a mental hospital in 1954, seven years after the Black Dahlia's death, because he was hearing voices. Could this be due to guilt? Potentially. And number two, the 9th of January, 1986, which is 39 years to the day that he dropped Elizabeth off at the Biltmore Hotel, Robert Manley died due to an accidental fall in his apartment, which is very interesting. There are some theories out there that maybe this was a potential suicide. I'm not altogether sure what his apartment was like, but if it was a high rise apartment, that could easily just look like a fall when it's actually a suicide, but we don't know. And it was just the, the coincidence of the fact that it was 39 years to the day that he last saw Elizabeth Short, who a few days later showed up murdered. I don't know. It's definitely not cold hard evidence, but it's just a bit, hmm. All right, suspect number two, and that's Mark Hansen. This is the guy whose name was on the address book that was sent in by the alleged killer, which as I'm saying that, I'm kind of like, if he was the one that killed her, why would he send in an address book with his name on the front of it? It just seems a bit like, I don't know. But anyway, Elizabeth's friend and roommate, Anne Toth, or Toth, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, had told investigators that Mark Hansen had made sexual advances towards Elizabeth and that it was a potential motive for him to kill her. Not sure of the details as to why, because uh, generally I feel like just because someone makes sexual advances towards you doesn't mean they want to kill you, but maybe I'm just naive, who knows? But he was later cleared from suspicion in the case anyway. I have a lot to say about this third suspect, and I'm not just saying like opinion-wise, just mean fact-wise. There's just so much weird bits of information about him. He's not a good dude. And his name is George Hodel. George Hodel breezed through surgery in medical school. So he didn't just have the medical knowledge, he breezed through medical school, which is interesting. His house had a secret room where the children weren't allowed to go, sketchy. And speaking of children, he had 11 of them with five different women. <laughs> and I know that doesn't necessarily make you a murderer, but it could allude to potentially reckless behavior, you know? And George had been accused by his own daughter of sexually assaulting her when she was only 14. She also accused him of offering her up to his friends for sex when she was barely even a teenager. Now, another thing about this daughter, when she was 15, she gave birth to a baby girl. She gave the baby up for adoption and I don't know for a fact who the father is, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility that the father of this baby was her grandfather, which is such a disgusting sentence and I'm sorry I even had to say that. But then another thing about this whole sexual assault accusation and everything, there was speculation as to whether it even happened because the family didn't agree. They said, he didn't do this. And they said that the daughter was lying. Initially I was like, whoa, because they have such a big family. There's like five mothers and one father and 11 kids. So if they're all saying he didn't do this, but then were they there? Did they see it? I don't know. But also it was kind of theorized that maybe they just said that because George Hodel was the breadwinner. He was a very wealthy man. He took in a lot of money and funded this family. <laughs> and if they didn't have that, they would pretty much be screwed. But yeah, there's no hard proof either way, really. I mean, there would be if there was a paternity test, but 
And then in 1950, George fled the country and he moved to the Philippines until 1990. Another interesting thing about the Philippines, <laughs> oh, in Manila in 1967, a woman was found murdered. And I know that's not exactly evidence, but wait till I tell you the details of this murder. She was found on a vacant lot, so was the Black Dahlia. She was found bisected at the waist, so was the Black Dahlia. Nude, so was the Black Dahlia. And posed in a very similar way to the Black Dahlia. So is that just a coincidence? Maybe, is it fishy? Definitely, because it wasn't just in the Philippines and he was in the Philippines. She was found half a mile from where George Hodel lived. Very sketchy. The annoying thing about this, I'm not even done talking about George Hodel right now. <laughs> I didn't mention this before, but Steve Hodel, one of George's sons, actually became an LAPD officer and he ended up believing fully that his father was responsible for the Black Dahlia murder. And he also thinks he was responsible for the murder of Jean French, who was another young woman murdered only three weeks after the Black Dahlia murder. And Jean French was also found naked. She had suffered blows to the head and she had F-U-B-D written on her body in red lipstick. It's theorized that this B-D was Black Dahlia. And her body was also unusually posed in a vacant lot similar to Elizabeth. And I didn't even mention, but this took place in Los Angeles as well. I just, okay, I'm, I'm not even done. Let me just, let me just continue and then I'll say what I have to say. George also had very similar handwriting to the handwritten letters that were received from the killer. And he also had very similar handwriting to the F-U-B-D that was written on Jean French's body and the alleged suicide note that I showed you earlier. And another thing, because the police were so suspicious of him, they bugged his house. <laughs> they got an interesting audio tape from him. Basically, he says, supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia, they couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary anymore because she's dead. <laughs> I want to know more about how the secretary died, actually. Maybe I should look that up right now. His secretary died of a drug overdose. Hmm. Another thing about George. <laughs> God, I just feel like this list goes on and on and on. He had some pictures in a photo album of a woman that looked very, very like Elizabeth Short, like eerily so. And they did have experts look at these pictures and try to determine if it was her or not. And they couldn't conclude yes, and they also couldn't conclude no. Sandy. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> but yeah, around this time, though, the LAPD were pretty corrupt. <laughs> Not exactly sure why I bothered to say around this time, but... <laughs> but all physical evidence, you heard that right, all physical evidence from the case disappeared. So it was thought maybe this just occurred due to incompetence, maybe it wasn't filed correctly, or maybe George paid them off because he was a very wealthy man. He would be able to do that if he needed to. Also, I can't believe, like how many times do I have to say and or also about George Hodel? But to make him look even more suspicious, he had some 50 pound bags of concrete delivered to his house on the 9th of January, 1947, the day the Black Dahlia was last seen alive. And similar sacks were found very near her body. And it's thought that maybe these were used to transport each half of her body, like in and out of the car and that kind of thing. Okay. <laughs> How can one person look so suspicious? Like it's, 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 I can't, I'm not, I have no words, I just. Okay, let's just have a quick brief moment talking about suspect number four, who uh, doesn't have a name because I just keep seeing reports of a man. So there was this mysterious man seen on that vacant lot on the night of the 14th or the early hours of the 15th, around the time the Black Dahlia was murdered. Oh, sorry, I just heard like screams outside and I'm talking about murder, so it's I'm very on edge. So this mysterious man was seen by a neighbor and he apparently had this black car. So the right rear door of the car was open and this 
mysterious man was just standing in the vacant lot. Ooh, this is giving me the creeps. And when this man noticed the neighbor, he became startled and he got in his car and drove away. And I did read somewhere that this mysterious man had been cleared of suspicion, but I'm not exactly sure why, because that's a very suspicious coincidence. And you're not gonna believe what I'm about to say. <laughs> to make this mysterious man more suspicious, George Hodel also had a very similar black car. Hmm. <laughs> Ooh. But yeah, honestly, just over in this whole case, there were so many leads, so many potential connections, potential connected crimes, potential ideas, suspects, blah, blah, blah. I just, after going through all of them, I just didn't feel like a lot of them were significant enough to be of note. It was kind of like, ooh, what if this? But it was like not really based on much evidence or anything. So I think the most substantial stuff is the stuff that I've included in this video. But obviously this murder left a massive mark on the world. It is one of the most famous unsolved murders. And also some good came of it because only two weeks after Elizabeth Short's murder, the Republican state assemblyman was prompted by this case to introduce a bill that would lead to the formation of a sex offender registry. And that would make California the first US state to have a sex offender registry, which is great. Like it's amazing that that good came of it. It's awful that Elizabeth Short had to die for something like that, that to happen, but at least there is some kind of legacy. But the thing is now, whoever killed Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, is very likely dead at this point and have probably taken their secret to the grave. So we may never know who killed the Black Dahlia. And that brings me to the end of this video. Let me know what you think of this case. I'm not altogether sure how I feel, but I certainly have theories as you've probably guessed. <laughs> like it's, it's so funny. Initially, I didn't really lean in any particular way, but then when I dug a bit more and found out everything I found out about George Hodel, I was just like, God. I just, if he didn't do it, he's very unfortunate and very unlucky because how can you look so suspicious and guilty if you haven't done anything? Do you know, it, it just, it's all coincidental. Nothing is cold hard evidence, but it just looks, doesn't look great. <laughs> but yeah, this is just such an interesting case. Thank you so much to Emily for sending this in. But yeah, as always, I'd love to know what you think. So leave a like, comment down below because uh, maybe we can have a bit of a back and forth and discuss and there is, there is a lot to discuss in this one. So um, who knows? Who knows what happened, but let's have a little chat about it. Yeah, my Instagram and Twitter is katefilpot underscore YT. And that's about it. Sandy, have you got anything do you want to plug? Again, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.